thank Dentistry uh, 16 and also Dentistry 15, because I was here last year, uh, for bringing me again and allowing me to be part of this event. It's really a, a, a great program, and for me, it, it, it's a great honor and challenge to be on stage at the same day of, of John Kanka and Lorenzo Vanini, and also for me, uh, one of the best teachers in the world, Frank Spear. So uh, I was watching Frank Spear uh, lecture, and it was, uh, one more time, amazing, amazing thinking process, and what I can tell you is that uh, I'm a huge fan of his way of thinking, so actually what we've been doing on the last decade was trying to uh, learn from these guys and develop a protocol through technology to implement their treatment planning ideas. So this is actually almost like a continuation of Frank Spear lecture, uh, bringing uh, the thinking process and taking advantage of technology to design better smiles, uh, treatment plan better interdisciplinary cases, understand better the integration between lip dynamics, soft tissue, teeth, and face, uh, and create a protocol uh, to be more predictable with the final outcomes, uh, bringing together the initial project and the final results of our treatments really trying to uh, have more confidence when offering these type of interdisciplinary cases to our patients and bringing this whole technology in a very, very realistic way to our daily work. Uh, it doesn't matter if we have a normal restorative clinic, if we have an interdisciplinary office, if we work by ourselves or if we have a big team, if we work with a chain of clinics, more production, less production, it doesn't really matter. We believe that uh, technology is completely ready uh, to uh, help us. So I actually, through this uh, one hour and a half that I have, I will bring to you this philosophy of designing smiles and treatment planning and I will try to highlight 12 specific insights uh, during this one hour and a half. The first one is about the vision of where we want to be at the end of the treatment. Uh, through all these years working as a technician, I'm a dental technician for almost 20 years and I had the pleasure to work with some amazing dentists. Uh, I was able to understand one simple uh, message that usually when we were finishing cases and the cases were not exactly the way we wanted them to be. Uh, the problems were usually not related to lack of skills, lack of science, or lack of knowledge. They were usually much more related to lack of vision. So I understood that uh, at a certain point in our career when we all control in a good level what we do technically, and we have a good scientific background of what we do, the next step is improving our visualization. Understanding before touching the patient the discrepancy between where we are and where we want to be. Because for us, treatment planning is trying to find a solution for this discrepancy, exactly as we saw this morning with Frank Spear. So for us, every single dental treatment has very specific three moments. Performing is actually being a clinician is doing dentistry, treating intraorally the patient. We all know that before that we need to treatment plan, but we also believe that before treatment plan, we have to do something very, very important that is smile designing. And this is, for me, uh, the, one of the biggest lessons that I learned from people like Frank Spear, facially driven dentistry. For me, facially driven dentistry means smile design comes before treatment planning and not after. We need to start from the face. We need to treatment plan outside in and then try to find fun functional and biological solutions to improve and to put all these pieces together. It's exactly like building a house. We have the builders, we have the engineers, and we have the architect, and the architect always finishes his project before the engineer try to find the technical solutions to make this project happen. And there's a very interesting quote, 
quote, quote from another great mentor, Peter Dawson, that uh, says something like this in his book, and I, I really like this because I saw myself in this quote, that we usually spend 90% of our time getting better on things that are responsible of 10% of our problems. And unfortunately, we usually, as dentists and technicians, we spend 10% of our time with things that are actually responsible of 90% of our problems. So I really saw myself as a dentist technician on this quote, putting sometimes a lot of effort on things that are not making the big difference for the patient. And I realized that making a big difference means becoming a better smile designer and treatment planner. A good clinician is something that is mandatory. Of course, we all need to be good clinicians. That's an obligation. But being a treatment planner is a beautiful differential because I believe that treatment planning very well is actually more difficult than performing a good clinical treatment. And actually, if treatment planning is based on a smile design project, becoming a very good smile designer is the ultimate challenge for, for our team nowadays. So the vision, improving our vision, is the first insight that I want to share with you. The focus of the lecture today will be on this moment, in between the first time we see a patient, the first time we document and we do an initial clinical exam, all the way to the moment where we plan our procedures and we plan which devices we're going to use in what sequence on this specific treatment. So from documenting this information, sharing with the specialist this information, designing the smile, treatment planning the solution to achieve a result as close as possible to this design, presenting this project to the patient, engaging the patient, motivating the patient, creating case, case acceptance, and then sitting down with the, with the lab and understanding every single device that we need to produce, and I'm not only talking about final restorations, these are just the final detail, but all the devices that we need to produce to make this initial project become reality, and that this final outcome is as similar as possible to this initial project. So I realized that during many, many years of my career, I was building diagnostic wax ups for dentists, and then I was realizing that final outcomes were not necessarily very similar to, to this initial wax up. And for me, this was something uh, frustrating to realize how unpredictable we were. If we make a simple test and we make impressions of our final outcomes and we pour models of these impressions and we compare these models with the initial diagnostic wax up that we did, we will realize how unpredictable dentistry is even if we are working with a very skilled team. So I believe this is the new challenge of dentistry, improving predictability in a very simple and controlled way. So for us, the only way to make this happen is through technology. Technology is the way to help us make these projects become reality in a more simple way. Every time people come to me and say, why should I engage technology? Why should I do digital dentistry? I believe besides all the technical advantages of doing it, the major advantage as, is to link the initial design or wax up or project to the final outcome of our cases. So technology will automatically help us directly in five moments in our work. The first moment is smile design. We can analyze the face better with technology. We can understand better the integration with lip, dy lip dynamics. We can integrate different concepts into the process of designing a smile with technology. Through technology, we can automatically treatment plan better with the same knowledge. I'm not even talking about getting more knowledge on treatment planning. I'm saying with the same knowledge that we already have, just by improving visualization, just by being able to test drive on the computer in 3D the possibilities, we will make better decisions, we will treatment plan better our cases. It's an amazing, powerful tool to interact with the patient. There's no better way to educate patients, to motivate patients, than creating a visual 3D presentation about everything that we're going to be able to do for this patient. 
nowadays as well, there's not even one device that we use in the patient's mouth that cannot be produced completely digital with CAD CAM technology. Everything can be produced with extremely high precision and quality and aesthetics. Not only restorations, veneers, crowns, and dentures, but also guides, aligners, orthodontic appliances, crown lengthening guides, prep guides, surgical guides, orthognatic splints. Everything can be planned, designed, and produced beautifully through digital technology. And finally, we can create and incorporate in our work a very simple concept that is used in business, in engineer, in architecture, of quality control, that we should be doing this in dentistry as well. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing quality control procedures in between each important step of our treatment. And I can use as an example orthodontics and periodontics. We can in a very simple way, overlap the image of a post-ortho treatment into the initial idea of ortho movements and realize if the orthodontist did what we wanted them to do, how far off we are, what can we do to get closer to our initial project. The same thing with all the other procedures that we do in dentistry. So it's extremely simple and super powerful to do quality control in a specific and important moments of our treatment. So it's not about denying what we did in the past. It's not about digital against analog. It's about analog plus digital because the principles, the fundamentals are exactly the same. And that's why I was mentioning Frank Spear lecture. He was lecturing and there was nothing about digital in his lecture, but the principles that he was sharing with us are extremely powerful and are still the same since decades. So we need to take these principles, incorporate them into technology to allow these principles to become easier to us. I realized that few mentors were, were speaking the same things for decades and for some reason the huge majority of dentists were not using that information and that knowledge. And for me the reason was that that was not easy to implement. It was not easy to make this reality on a single day basis. And the way to make this the normal way to do it is through technology in my understanding. So I always like to highlight that our treatment planning mentors are still exactly the same and these principles haven't changed. What we want is to make these principles more feasible, more realistic through technology. So t technology will not change the, our quality as clinicians. We need to be good clinicians at first and then take advantage of technology to move even further. It is a par paradigm shift. It's not easy to change. We all know that the most comfortable situation is to stay in our comfort zone and technology brings discomfort situations because we need to incorporate things that we are not used to. And as a technician, I can say that my life changed completely and things that I was doing five years ago to survive and make my money, I don't do it anymore. We do things in a completely different way and we cannot fight against this evolution. It's gonna happen and it's gonna happen very, very fast. A little advice that I can share with you about new technologies is that every time I see something that is, looks cool, every time a company comes to me to show something new that they want me to buy or they want me to start using, I always make a simple test what we call a reality test. I really try to look at this technology, this equipment or this material and try to imagine this on my workflow and try to see if this new thing can help me do something better, faster and less expensive. Because if we can combine this, that means that that new thing is worth giving a try. There's also a new concept that I believe is very important that we, we can see in what we call modern dentistry, that is the fact that being a good clinician and doing something very well by itself, it's not gonna make the difference anymore. And I can use as an example, if you combine a good technician that do, does a good wax up and a good dentist that does a good prep, in our vision, this is not good enough nowadays. Because now prepping very well is not enough. We need to prep guided by this initial project. The prep needs to be related to the wax up. 
It's not only doing a good prep, but making a prep that has a relationship to a specific project. So we can think about every single procedure that we do, not only tooth preparation. We need to link the procedures. Every time we do a procedure in the patient's mouth, we need to realize if this procedure is somehow linked to the previous procedure and how we're going to link this procedure to the following procedure. And with orthodontics, is the same. It's not only good enough having a very good orthodontist that knows all the biomechanics of how to move teeth. The question now is how can we move teeth according to a specific project? How can we make these movements to allow us to restore these teeth on the ideal way possible for the patient? So we can see on this slide a full sequence of events, all interconnected, bringing us from a before to an interesting after. And I can tell you that in the analog world, this is not easy to replicate on a daily basis. And usually when we see this happening in lectures, these are usually one in a lifetime case that we picked exactly to show in a lecture. And sometimes we even try to pretend that this is what we do every single day. And we know that it's not that easy. For us to make this workflow happen can only happen through technology. And I'm gonna try to show how we've been helping dentists to create these procedures or control these procedures through devices that are built according to a digital 3D project that we did to the patient. So when we have a patient that we do an initial project, that we have this initial vision, that we believe crown lengthening, for example, is a good way to improve their smile and have a decent, nice, final outcome, Nowadays, it's not just sending this patient to the periodontist and hoping that the periodontist will do something exactly like this, but it's somehow creating this 3D project and transforming this into a realistic, real, realistic model project and then creating guides to help the periodontist to remove soft tissue and bone exactly where we need, exactly the amount that we need, to get a final result that we want, that we actually presented to the patient. So for us, through technology, we can for the first time actually say this to the patient, that we have a big chance to end up in a place that we know exactly where it is. So we can design the smiles according to the face, we can transform 2D projects into 3D projects, and we can then understand exactly what needs to be done to make that project happen. So we can integrate all specialties into this treatment if necessary. So a simple example here, the patient doesn't like her smile. We don't know if this patient needs ortho, yes or no, or it's only veneers or veneers and crowns, or ortho and veneers, do we need to open the vertical, yes or no? for functional reasons, biological reasons, or aesthetic reasons. All these questions are in our head when we first see a patient like this. So we always start from a facially driven smile design project that will be an additional f information gathered together with all the documentation that we all do from our patients. We can also, through technology, design smiles more beautiful because of one simple factor. Through scanning technology, we can nowadays scan nature. So we don't need to stress anymore trying to reproduce nature with our own hands if we can have library of tooth that looks exactly like natural dentition when it comes to shapes and texture. So we can incorporate these beautiful natural files into our digital wax up, into our mock-ups, provisionals, dentures, final restorations. And this is a concept that I learned from one of my mentors, Dr. Paulo Cano. So here we go, fitting these new uh, natural shapes into the facially guided smile frame of the patient. We can then transform this project into a test drive project to present to the patient the possibility of the smile change. And we can even further guarantee to the patient that when we move into the final restorations, we can actually produce restorations that are very, very, very similar because it's exactly the same file from the initial project, mock-ups, and 
provisionals. And this for me as a technician is just beautiful. For many years, I've been working, designing smiles on wax ups and then having to start from scratch on provisionals and then having to start from scratch again on the final restorations. It just doesn't make sense to spend that much effort to design a smile that was already solved at the first moment. So here you're just seeing how an initial project can become final restorations in a very, very simple way with technology that almost every single CAD CAM already provides our technicians. So we can actually overlap the files. So you see here on the top, it's the initial digital 3D wax up that we did, facially driven. And then whenever we get the impression of the preps, we can overlap this, recreate beautiful restorations with beautiful natural shapes that don't need to be touched, don't need to be cut back, don't need to be layered, don't need to be waxed, don't need to be pressed. They're completely milled because milling machines nowadays can reproduce beautiful morphology and beautiful texture. So it's a different, a completely different world that we are forecasting for us on the next few years that we will be able to really enjoy doing beautiful restorative dentistry. So we can see all the shapes and we can export these files into machines that can actually then mill these restorations. So you can see from all angles how we were able to copy exactly the project in the CAD CAM software and reproduce the initial diagnostic digital wax up into the final restoration. Exactly the same overbite, overjet, vertical dimension, occlusal scheme, shape, and texture. Now it's just a matter of picking the block, picking the color, picking the value that we want, and companies are really developing amazing materials for us to finish our anterior restorations with monolithic blocks. That is also the future. Monolithic restorations, no more stress with layering and waxing and pressing and cutbacks. This is already uh, going to change very, very fast. We can solve 60, 70, up to 80% of our anterior cases in a beautiful way with this type of restoration, straight from the machine into the patient's mouth, sometimes stain and glaze if necessary, and that's it. So we have to understand block selection. Material selection becomes the key because we need to understand the values and the colors that of these blocks to pick the right material for the machine to produce this beautiful restoration for us. Because shape and texture and precision is already taken care of by technology. So we can see that machines are giving us results that we can be proud of, that we can be very comfortable offering our patients. And this is insight number two, creating the link, the link between procedures, the link between the initial design and ortho and perio and implants and orthognatic and restorations. So I want to use this next case as an example, uh, now jumping more into the thinking process of treatment planning. I believe that uh, the challenge here on cases like this is that when we see patients like this, opening their mouths to us and talking about their problems, sometimes we don't have a clear idea about what should we do. And that's normal. This is why I believe that treatment planning is actually more difficult than actually performing the case clinically. For me, the areas that I really wanted to improve myself were decision-making process, risk assessment, and treatment planning understanding the best solution for this patient. Becoming the architect and the engineer of this case, it doesn't matter who's going to be the builder, who's going to be the clinician. Understanding which procedures are the best, pros and cons, the options that we have, in what sequence do we organize these procedures, and in what timing. I believe these are the challenges of modern interdisciplinary dentistry. So I realized that one of the first things that I could do to help my eyes see better and try to organize my thoughts was 
to create simple photography and draw lines over these photographies, to bring the face into the mouth, to understand the references, understand the discrepancies, understand the problems where I wanted to be at the end of the treatment. So that's how we started many, many years ago, drawing lines, creating a protocol of drawings that we do over every single patient. Now, when we move from 2D into 3D, with all the beautiful softwares that we have, what are the problems? Why we don't see more and more people going into 3D? I believe that the problem of dental software is that the companies and the software developers were not focusing on the area that we need more help. They were focused on creating huge technology with huge learning curve to help us on the 10% that I mentioned, when our biggest problem was on the 90%, smile design, treatment planning, thinking process, team communication, interaction with the patient, diagnosing the problem, designing the solution. This is where we need more help, I believe, and the softwares all over the world were not ready. Why? First, because they were fragmented. The restorative CAD CAM software didn't have nothing to do with the ortho software, that didn't have nothing to do with the orthognatic software, that didn't have nothing to do with the implant software. How can we treatment plan a patient in an interdisciplinary way if we cannot connect the dots, if we cannot test drive the integration between different procedures? The other big problem is that these softwares are not facially driven. You don't see the face, they don't come outside in, they don't allow you to bring the face into the game. So all these softwares are actually telling you, you have to struggle through the analog, old way of doing things in the most difficult part of the process. You have to design smiles in the analog world, you have to treatment plan your cases in the analog world. When everything is ready, when you know exactly what to do, how to do, and the final outcome that you want, then you can use the software. But it's a waste of technology if we only use technology at this little bit of the final end of the process. So we believe in an interdisciplinary platform. What does that mean? It's a platform where you can explore all the possibilities. It's a platform where you can bring your patient and throw your patient into this platform when you don't know nothing about what can be do or if you're confused about the options. And when you bring this patient into this platform, you can test drive. What about moving the teeth? What happens? Just move the teeth digitally in 3D. What happens with the veneers if we move the teeth? What happens with the bite? What happens with the space, with the clearance? Do we have space for implants? What happens if we move the whole jaw with orthognatic? Is that an option? Does it make sense, yes or no? We usually say that the best moment to make mistakes is in the computer before even touching the patient. We can play with the options and we can have freedom to explore the pros and cons of each one of these options. So this is exactly what we do nowadays. We work with this platform, this platform to design and treatment plan and present the case to the patient. And afterwards, we can do the treatment the same way we always did. We can use technology on the treatment. That's a detail compared with this initial part of the process. So I'm gonna use this patient as an example of how we go through the process of brainstorming the treatment with a 3D platform. The first thing that we need to do is we need to digitalize our patient. What does that mean? Very simple. We need photos and videos. We need to scan their bite, scan their arches. We need a CBCT, we need x-rays. Everything nowadays is digital. You take this information, you put together, and you throw inside this platform, and now your patient is completely digitalized. Now, what the software is gonna do is gonna combine this information. It's gonna put CBCT, STLs, photos and videos all together, calibrate them, so now you can rotate, you can open, you can see from underneath, you can have a 3D vision of your patient and really start to brainstorm about solutions. So we always start from the face. It doesn't matter if we believe that this is a simple, let's say, four unit composite case, for example. It doesn't matter. We always start the same way. It becomes the only way to do it. Analyze the face, understand the lines, and create an initial 3D project. It's like transforming every single patient into a denture patient. 
So what we do is to actually erase the patient's actual teeth and gum and give us completely freedom to put the teeth, the ideal denture of the patient, wherever we want, according to facially driven principles, aesthetic parameters, denture principles, cephalometric measurements, information that come from the face and gives us a suggestion of where the upper teeth should be according to that face. We still don't have a clue if this design will harm occlusion, will harm biology, if it's possible, if it's simple, or if it's difficult. We always start from the ideal. Once we have this ideal digital 3D denture or wax up, as we call, you can then start putting some transparency here and seeing in 3D the relationship between our vision and the actual situation. How easy it is to make this project happen. So what you see in white here is the facially driven design and what you see in pink is where the patient jaw and teeth and gum is right now. There is a discrepancy. What to do with this discrepancy? Can we shift everything and fix the midline? How can we intrude the right side? Is it, is it worth doing it? Does the patient want to go through? Does the patient have the money to do it? We don't know, but we have the obligation to understand the big picture, to have a clear vision of all the options, and to present the patient exactly the ideal final outcome, and from there, simplify as much as we can all the way to the reality of the patient so they can make a conscious decision about what they want to do and what they don't want to do. So we can easily, in the software, start to understand what we want to do with this case. So for example, when I look at this image here and I see this discrepancy, the first thought that comes to my mind is, can we do orthognathy? And the other, my colleague is saying, are you crazy? She's a 75 years old lady. She will never say yes to orthognathic. I don't care, it's just a softer. It's five minutes to do it, it's 30 seconds to undo it. And I have the option in front of me. So we start with the idea. What about ortho? Can we shift everything with ortho? What with, if we keep the midline discrepancy? Maybe it's not a big deal. What do we do with the right side? Can we do endo? crown lengthen and cut these teeth in half? Can we intrude with ortho? Can we use mini implants and speed up the orthodontic procedure? Should we fragment the bone and do an osteotomy and intrude this as a whole block? These are options that I started to learn as a smile designer because I was interacting with all these specialists and brainstorming about these options. So we decided to give it a try for orthognatic. We're gonna plan on lift four, shift and calibrate the midline, segment the right side and intrude the right side and see what happens with the rest of the treatment. We need to go backwards and see and start to put the pieces together as a puzzle. What is the first piece of the puzzle now? We need to fit the lowers against this new upper position. So this is exactly what we are doing here. We are fitting the lower against the uppers and we are then simulating orthognatic. So where we are and where we want to be. Where we are and where we want to be. Very nice. So what I'm doing is not just sending my patient to the orthognathic surgeon. I'm giving him the shell of exactly the final outcome that I want. And I want this orthognathic surgeon to learn how to do modern orthognathic surgery. Moving the jaw inside my project. Moving the jaw to match the final outcome that we want. So we started to look at this project, so you see here the shift, okay? So on the bottom is treating the patient without orthognathic. On the top is treating the patient with the shift, with orthognathic. What is better? I don't know, we are still brainstorming. We are still in the process to make decisions. We can compare the face, we can see aesthetically the impact of fixing the midline. Maybe the patient loves it, maybe the patient doesn't care. We're gonna present the patient all the options. What is very nice is to see that the teeth now are inside the project, inside the ideal final outcome. And it's beautiful to be able to play with this in the software. You can put transparencies, you can rotate, you can move, you can zoom in, zoom out. You can make comparisons between restoring on the old maxilla position and restoring on the new maxilla position. So this is where we want to be with the upper jaw. 
we can shift, you can see exactly the shift and the impaction the, uh, on the right side, what we are doing to fix the midline. Since we are here on the orthogonatic part and we believe that maybe this can be an option, you can easily design the splint and the splint will link this new upper position with the lowers. So when we cut the Lefort here, they will move exactly into our stent, into this new position fragmenting and intruding and shifting the midline. So now we proceed, what is the next step? Is to see what is the relationship between the lower arch and the new upper design. The upper is beautiful with the face. Maybe the lower is not that great with the upper now. And maybe this relationship is too complicated to fix and we will have to move the upper back a little bit. We don't know, we're gonna test drive now. What we can immediately see is that of course as we shift, we open a big gap here and we get really tight over there. The other thing that we see is that as we wax the lowers here, we can either match these lowers to the actual lower position or we can match to the new upper position. What do we do? We always start from ideal. So we're gonna wax the lowers against the uppers, ignoring the actual position of the rest of the lowers. And you can see here that when we look from the occlusal, we have a big step here and we have an overlapping. We are missing some space if we do want to make the lowers ideal. Remember, we have to place implants. I don't even know how the bone is underneath these crowns. This is the next step. It's always on the same direction, outside in. And then we're gonna simplify the treatment as much as we can inside out. So we see here 1.2 millimeters lacking of space. We need to expand the lower arch and we need to see if we have the space to do that. So what we do now is very simple. We bring this project into the orthodontic part of the software and let's play as a restorative dentist, moving teeth around to see what happens. So we're gonna easily move the lowers against the uppers, against the future uppers. And this is so easy to do with 3D technology. So you can see here what is going on. This is old school digital orthodontics, moving teeth completely lost in space. And this is the new way of doing digital orthodontics, is moving teeth according to a 3D project. So we are moving teeth according to the lowers and we can see here that if we align the lowers, we can actually fit all the teeth, we can calculate exactly the amount of stripping if we do need stripping, and we can plan the aligners to make this movement exactly the way we want. So beautiful. I can place the implants on the future ideal position. I can immediately load them with the future shapes and then retroactive, I can do orthodontic towards this new design that I have. So you can see here the before, you can see the after now. We have very nice intercuspation, space distribution. You can look from all different angles and it's beautiful, just so easy and powerful to do digital ortho setups and the most Better, the best out of this is that not only orthodontists, but we can all play with this and we can all plan our cases with this and we can then send this to orthodontists, to our orthodontists to say, is this possible? Is this realistic? How much time this will take? How much this will cost? What system do you want to use? Do you want to use aligners, braces, lingo braces, whatever? How can we make this happen? And that's when the discussion starts with the orthodontist. So now we have the final step of this specific case. I need to fit the implants into this picture. So what I'm gonna do now, always what we do is to fit the implant according to the crown that is facially driven designed. So you can see that the crowns are now beautifully positioned and we can, for the first time, check where the bone is according to this crown. So what happens here, you see where we were and where we want to be. We see the bones and we see the implants, very nice. And I can now for the first time check if there is enough bone to put the implants exactly where we want, to have the lowers exactly where we want, to occlude with the uppers exactly where we want, to have the anteriors exactly the way we want with the lips and the face. At this moment we have two situations. 
We do have perfect bone exactly where we need or we don't have bone where we need. And when we don't have bone, we have two options. Either we graft the area to keep the design and to keep everything exactly the way we want and we need to evaluate pros and cons, or I can move the lowers to facilitate the sur surgery. And this is another beautiful brainstorm because if I move the implants into the bone to make my surgery more simple and to allow the patient to avoid stressful grafting procedures, for example, I move the implants, I have to move the crowns because sometimes I cannot fix this discrepancy with the abutment. And if I want to test this, I can test the design of the abutment from a non-ideal implant position to an ideal crown position and see if we can fix that with the abutment. And if we cannot fix that with the abutment, we have to change the position of these crowns. So let's change the position of the lowers to facilitate the surgery. And if we change the position of the lowers, we have to change the position of the uppers to match this new position of the lowers. And many times when we, met, we change this position, we have to change this position. And when we change this position, we're going to check with the face. So we go all the way back and we see if that decision impacted the facial integration of our treatment. And then we can make the final decision. Should we stick with the more complicated, better facial outcome? Should we simplify and change a little bit the facial design? Can we show this to the patient and then have the patient decide together with us what is the best option for them? So this is a brief summary of a simple brainstorm that we can do with the same knowledge that we already have and really improve our skills as treatment planners. As we present this storyline, we're gonna present this storyline to the patient almost exactly the same way I'm explaining this to everybody here today. So it's a beautiful line, a thinking process, a story that brings the patient from A to Z that really makes them comfortable and proud of being there with you and very grateful for you giving this time to explain them the reasons for each one of the options. Now, amazingly, this patient here was actually a patient for my dad. We presented this and she actually said yes to everything. She said, yeah, I will do everything. And we were like, oh my God, now we are in trouble. <laughs> we have to make this happen. And she said, with one condition, if you can do all the surgery in the same day. And I'm like, all the surgery, there's some extraction, there's implant placement, bone graft, periosurgery, orthognatic, lift four, segmented surgery. And my dad is, yeah, we can do that. And I'm like, mm, my God, what do we do now? We can do this, why? Because we can transform this into devices. Okay, so this part here creates files that will be printed and milled into models and restorations. This part of the file will create surgical guides and immediate loading provisionals exactly the same way we plan. This part will create the aligners that we will place in the patient's mouth right after surgery to move the teeth into that position. So we can pre-slice them and start to integrate this to the bridge that will be placed in over the implants. And we can rate, create these files through uh, the orthognatic part to actually create the splints for the surgery. So just to make a long story short, what we do here, and we do this a lot, is what we call a day hospital procedure. Patient goes early morning, general anesthesia, and we do that a lot for patients with phobia, super busy patients, people from out of town. It's something that works very, very nicely because you can combine three, four, five appointments in one sometimes. So sometimes early morning comes, the endodontist does some endo, goes away, the perio comes, some crown length and goes away, the implant guy comes, place an implant, orthognatic comes, cut the bone, reposition everything, the restorative come, bone some restorations, done, wake up the patient. So, this is what happens here, exactly what happened with the patient. We can see on the picture that they sent us the final outcome here of the restorations immediately placed, the segmentation, the new occlusal plane, and this is the crazy patient after three months actually saying that she's happy. Okay, so I was worried about her reaction after orthognatic surgery saying, are you guys crazy offering me this? I suffered so much and she was actually super happy of going through this and having the teeth that she always wanted, etc. As Frank Spears said in the morning, 
We have to offer all the options. We have to have the big picture. We cannot underestimate what our patients want or deserve. So this is insight number three. The interdisciplinary software platform for increasing visualization, team communication, and treatment planning. Software is not to produce CAD CAM restoration or guides. Software for us is for the beginning to improve the plan that we will produce and present to the patient. So if everything starts from this project, the project starts from what we call the smile frame. So I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about what is the smile frame. The smile frame is a simple procedure that we do, drawing lines over specific pictures, four pictures of the patient that will help us to have this vision of where the teeth upper teeth should be according to that face, to understand the integration of these upper anterior teeth and the face. So we document the case, we usually do it with an iPhone, very simple, some specific videos. From the videos we make photos, From, and in the photos we make drawings. We make drawings following aesthetic principles that we'll, I will summarize quickly what they are. Inside these drawings, this is one, one smile frame, Export 2D into 3D, you have the initial ideal project of the patient. This is the moment where we're going to export this project into the interdisciplinary platform to see what can be done to make this project happen or how much we need to change of this project to facilitate the treatment. So everything starts with the 2D smile frame. This is actually done in 10 steps and they are all made based on a facial dynamic analysis. We don't make smile design decisions looking at static photos. We make decisions looking at the movement because beautiful smiles are beautiful when a patient is moving. So we need to change our perception by analyzing videos and not photos. And by looking at photos or videos of the patient, we have to make 10 decisions, utilizing our principles, our knowledge, the aesthetic parameters that we learn, we need to look at this face and determine where we want the midline to be, where we want the incisal edge to be, where do we want the interdental proportion to be, where we want the intradental proportion of the central to be, where do we want the gum line to be, papilla curve to be, and then from the frontal perspective, easily draw where we are and where the smile frame is suggesting we should be. And then from the top picture, the 12 o'clock picture, we can analyze the relationship with the wet line of the lower lip and understand where we are and where we believe we should be. It's like doing a 2D wax up. And then from the occluso, where we analyze very well space distribution, we can see with the arch curve where we are and where we want to be. Three pictures are calibrated to each other. These are eight steps that we do on these three pictures. And after that, we jump into the sagittal. And it's really very, very powerful to utilize as a restorative dentist and as a technician the sagittal view to design smiles. And I don't know why I ne it took me so long to realize this. It took me so long to learn some simple cephalometric principles from my orthodontist colleagues and orthognatic surgeons to understand two, three, four principles. And, and Frank Spear was able to give us two simple principles that he uses from the sagittal view to improve the decision-making process of where to position the central. So I'm gonna give you some of the information that we use. The first beautiful thing that we do is to take a smile profile picture. We don't even need the cephalometric of the patient. What we need as smile designers from the dentist is a side picture with the side retractor and the model because then we're going to scan the model and in the software we're going to calibrate the 3D model over the 2D picture. So this is exactly what you see on the computer. Then you, we have to learn how to position this patient and the picture on the natural head position, how to draw the true vertical line, how to make measurements to understand the occlusion plane and the inclination of the central incisor. Now, if the dentist sends us the cephalometric, even better, because we can then add cephalometric measurements into the wax up, into the 3D position of the centrals. So what you see on the software is something like this. Look how nice it is to be able to design a smile with this extra information. So what you see in white is my digital wax, and I'm positioning this in 3D taking in consideration what the cephalometric is suggesting. Blue is where we are, and according to cephalometric measurements, the 
suggestion is red. So I can check and see if red is possible, if I can position the wax in red, if I can make red possible with simple veneers, if I need to move with orthodontic plus veneers, if I need to move orthognatic, orthodontic, and veneers. The options become very, very clear, very, very obvious. That's why we naturally become better treatment planners when we have these tools. So you can see the wax up even, you can even erase the model and see only the two floating in the air. And I just want to summarize the ideas that I learned that I used designing smiles from a restorative perspective with cephalometric information. The first thing that we need to learn is the natural head position. How to take a picture with the patient on the natural head position. This is the key factor. There's a simple article that explains the natural position and explains how to capture this picture of a natural head position. If you can send this picture to your technician, I can guarantee he can draw two lines of this picture and he's gonna deliver to you a better wax up, a better facially guided wax up. Then we need to learn how to draw the true vertical line, and that's very simple. It goes over here, the subnasal, and this is our zero. Everything that is on the left is minus, everything that is on the right is plus, as we learned from Bill Arnett, one of the top orthognatic surgeons in the world. So we can start bringing information here, okay? The first information that they give is that usually beautiful faces, they have a specific distance from the front head forehead to this line. They have a specific distance between the buckle of the centrals and this line. So there's a window, minus seven to minus point, uh, 11. So we want to try to create wax ups inside this window as possible with the most simple treatment as possible, of course. Then we can analyze up and down and see the incisal edge position on a vertical situation. And then comes the next trick that I learned from them. If you have the tr true vertical line, you draw this line, and the ideal occlusal plane should be in between 93 and 97 degrees, meaning that this will calibrate the amount of wax on the posterior teeth up, up and down. This will calibrate our denture if we set up the teeth a little bit lower or a little bit higher. We, one thing that is very important, smile design is never related to one specific analysis. We need to cross-check each one of the decisions. So at this moment, we are checking with the photos and most important with lit dynamics on the video to fine-tune the cephalometric suggestion when it comes to the occlusal plane. And finally, we can have a nice understanding about the inclination of the central according to an ideal profile. And this is the inclination. That angle should be in between 54 and 59 degrees and we can easily measure this on the software and see if our 3D wax up is following that principle. If we have the cephalometric, we can add the ANS analysis to check the relationship between our central and that extra position. And there's other authors explaining how to make that happen. Coconi and Andrews are explaining the ideal position of the central according to these extra lines. So basically four Simple information from the cephalometric, from the true uh, vertical line, understanding the distance between the central to the line, understanding the occlusal plane, understanding the axis of the central. So this is what we call the DSD smile frame. Three pictures on the left and one cephalometric analysis, combining everything and fine tuning our smile design. So when I do smile designs, even for simple veneer cases, for example, we are actually combining what we learn from experts in denture and experts in cephalometric. So you combine the frontal world with the sagittal world. And in 3D, you understand better what means a beautiful dental facial integration. Everything based on dynamic video analysis. Now, <clears throat> for me, what is more beautiful? is that this very interesting 2D project can nowadays be easily transported into 3D and you can start playing in the 3D world or your technician should be doing that for you. So the fourth insight, the cephalometric guided wax up. 
Every technician, modern technician, in my opinion, should understand these three or four basic principles of sagittal analysis of the face, understand how to draw these lines, and integrate their position according to this line, or at least re-evaluating, fine-tuning that position according to this information. So 2D becomes 3D nowadays. It's very, very simple to do that. And you can see the advantages from now on of doing a 3D wax up instead of an analog wax up. Instead of wasting time and energy on a face pull, there's no more reasons to do a face pull. I know that can sound, sounds a little bit drastic, but there's no reason to do a face pull if we can have this information on the 3D software. Look how nice it is to be able to draw these lines and understand these positions. And look how challenging and how unpredictable it is to do this in the analog world. Just by comparing screwing a face ball in the face with all the movements that we have and fine tuning this 0.01 degrees on the computer. So it's much more predictable, much more controlled, much more easier. You can see that when we do diagnostic wax ups, it doesn't matter how good the technician is, we always depend on human skills and many times the design is not right, symmetry is not there, axes are incorrect on the digital world. You can see that very well. You can bring the cephalometric again on this case, fine tune your wax up and understand the relationships. Look the difference between trying to set this plane here and doing this on the computer, sitting down, relax with every single piece of information in front of you. Playing with this information, it becomes almost like a game. It's fun to treatment plan. Look again, how unpredictable, what kind of information we have here and what kind of information we have here. That's why we believe that in the near future, diagnostic wax ups will disappear. We ourselves and our whole team, we don't do diagnostic wax ups anymore. We do digital wax ups. We print these models and we have the wax up in 3D in our hands. So I'm still designing the upper against the face, making the best design possible. And then after I determine the vertical, I can then find uh, the position of the lowers against the uppers. And you can see again how unpredictable here and how predictable and controlled we are here to make this happen. You can move this model in 3D. You can share these images with the dentist. You can discuss overbite and overjet beautifully with these images. Look how nice these calculations we have. We know, for example, that usually we try to achieve two and four. Overbite, overjet, two and four. This is the ideal. So we have parameters and we can measure this. And the dentist can see this in seconds. We can send this by the phone and they get this wherever they are. And they say, move a little bit here, move a little bit there, improve the vertical, change the angles, increase the overbite. Let's find another s solution and so on. So this is how we proceed when we want to integrate the lowers against the uppers. And this is usually when you start to see the limitations, the problems in between function and aesthetics, how to solve this problem, what are the options that we have to, be, to offer to the patient. Now, what is also very nice is that this 3D project can now be printed and printing technology is growing and printing technology is the future. And this is gonna be the same in dentistry. Every dentist will have a little printing machine in their office. Two years ago, three years ago, when we started to print these wax ups, uh, these projects, printing machines were 60, 70, $80,000. It came down to 50, 40, 30. Nowadays, we have very decent machines, portable machines with $3,000, $5,000 that we can buy, have chair side. And as the technician finishes, we press a button. It can be on the other side of the world, it's inside our machine. And in one or two hours, we have the model in our hands to try it in the patient's mouth to create the guides that we need to perform the treatment. So insight number six is the link between 2D and 3D. We start with 2D because it's simple and fast. You can use your phone. You make pictures on the specific angles, send to your technician, they're gonna make the drawings, you're gonna approve, you're gonna make your decisions. They will transform 2D into 3D. We can print these models, come back and test drive in the patient's mouth. So from digital to real. We can, of course, when we are presenting the plan to the patient, we can present the cases 
to create motivation with a digital simulation, 2D simulation here that we do on Keynote, for example, or PowerPoint. You can actually show the 3D view, but I think this is much more technical for us and the technician to discuss the design. This is what we usually do if we do want to show a simulation, but nothing is compared to what we call the motivational mock-up. Even if the mock-up is not ideal, if the pre-op situation of the patient is not ideal for an additive mock-up, in 80, 90% of the cases, we do a motivational mock-up at our own risk and expenses. We pay for that experience as a test drive, and this is increasing 30 to 50% case acceptance in every single clinic in the world that is doing this protocol. Initial photos, 2D project, 3D uh, project printed, try it in the mouth, show to the patient through videos and pictures, let the patient engage with this situation, and then present technically the treatment plan, is what we call the emotional dentistry approach. And that's what we do with every single smile design case. <clears throat> so this is what we call the motivational kit. What is the motivational kit? What we send to the dentist so he can explain the plan and increase case acceptance. The motivational kit is, has three pieces. The printed design with the tray that you can test in the mouth, you can put this in the mouth with Bizacryl. A 2D slide presentation that we do with all the images that the doctor sent to us, plus the 3D images that we did. And we put the project in 3D available online. So without having to buy software, without having to learn software, the dentist from his phone, from his laptop, from his computer can access the cloud and open this viewer platform where you can show the patient's model, occlusion, orthodontic simulation, orthognatic simulation, restorative simulation, implant position, everything in 3D. You can move, you can open, put transparency and present what he's seeing in his own mouth with the mock-up, present this project in 3D with these images. So this is just a quick example. This is the dentist logging in to the cloud system and there's no cost to do that. So you go there, you click on the name of your patient and then the doctor is presenting. The ortho simulation, before and after, and if you have any other pr procedures to be done, for example, in this case, some veneers. So now we are putting some transparency deleting before and after to show. And then if we have implants on this case, <clears throat> there is an implant over there. So you can rotate everything and show the relationship between the final design, the mock-up, the implant placement, why do you need to graft, why do you need two implants and not one, and so on. You create, you build your story based on this visual information. We always start like this. We never, ever, ever talk about technical treatment plan with the patient before we engage them emotionally. This is the most important here. They need to value our treatment plan because our treatment plan is valued a lot. They need to feel that they are honored of being there and listening to what we are sharing with them. And the only way to do that is to speak what they understand. Patients are not walking into our offices to buy, endo, to buy endo treatments, to buy implants, to buy surgeries. They hate this stuff. They prefer much more to listen to a project, to a smile project, to a smile design project, to explain and understand the impact of this beautiful experience of changing their lives by changing their smiles, by allowing them to enjoy and have confidence when smiling. So this is another example. Pre-up iPhone video, snapshots of the video, specific angles, 2D smile frame, approved by the doctor. It can become a wax-up. This is what we used to do. Nowadays, it's transformed into 3D. The 3D becomes an STL file that is exported and printed, and this can be then placed in the patient's mouth with the vacuum tray, a simple vacuum tray and some bisacryl, and then you can put in the patient's mouth, and this is done before the patient even knows what is the treatment, how long is gonna take the treatment, how much is gonna cost the treatment. We allow them to enjoy themselves like this, and when they are at the peak of their excitement, we say, okay, let's talk about treatment plan. <laughs> and let me tell you how much it's gonna cost. But it's usually the inverse, they ask you, they're so excited that they say, when can we start? How much is gonna cost? I really want to know more about 
how to make this happen. So insight number seven, the emotional dentistry approach, the motivational kit, the test drive marker, the motivational marker, and then the technical explanation with the 2D presentation and the 3D viewer. And hopefully the patient will say yes, and you will then be able to go back to your technician and say, look, remember that project, that patient, it's approved. So now please bring that project into every single piece of the software and plan all the devices that I need to make this happen. So this is the way we've been working. This is the way we've been communicating with the team of dentists that we are working nowadays. And of course, the world is very, very small nowadays. Everybody is in front of their phones and we can reach each other with a huge speed and efficiency through uh, the cloud. So the online asynchronous communication, communicating through the cloud is my eighth insight. Now, let me jump into ortho. How can we improve the ortho procedure? So this is a different patient. You see here the 2D, some digital simulation. Everything is okay, it's fine. Now becomes, now we start with the most interesting part. 2D again becomes 3D, exactly like I showed before, completely controlled. I don't even know if the patient needs restoration. Maybe it's just an ortho case, I don't care. I start from the face, I do the lines, I do the ideal 3D and let's take a look on the options. So you see the model integrated with the picture. If the patient, if the doctor sends us the CBCT, the CBCT will be there as well in 3D together with this whole information, everything calibrated. We can cut the lip, we can slide this underneath the lip. And now comes the beautiful part here because as we look from different angles, we can see the discrepancy. As I mentioned, for us, Treatment planning well is visualizing discrepancies, having a clear vision of where we are and where we want to be. So when it comes to ortho, of course, we look at this case and immediately we understand the power of ortho and we can explain this to the patient. This is, again, the old way of doing ortho. You just look at models. It's like Frank Spears said this morning, how can you plan looking at models? It's just impossible. This is one of the main messages I learned from him, from John Coyce, Gerard Shish, Peter Dawson. It's outside in. It's facially driven dentistry. This is modern dentistry. You have to at least understand what is the ideal possibility. Even if you're only gonna do the second molar inlay, we need to understand the big picture to become different, to become better. So here we see on the left side, old way of doing ortho, moving teeth without any reference, just aligning teeth according to the arch. What if the arch is on the wrong position? Now here you see the project in transparency and you can move teeth inside the project. So you can calculate the movement exactly, you can discuss with your orthodontist how to make that happen, you can show to the patient why we need to do ortho with these images. The images that I show on lectures are exactly the same images that we show to the patients because it's so easy to do it. It's just print screens, put some pictures together and show to the patient the possibility. So we see here the ortho part of the software simulating this and what is nice here that if the patient approves this, we can export this file and put this file inside any kind of orthodontic software. That's why we are working now in collaboration with Invisalign and Invisalign is gonna start integrating their system into the DSD concept. So whenever we plan a case and we have a clear vision of where we want to be, we can actually export this and their technicians will actually take that in consideration to try to make the ortho movement as similar as possible to what we are suggesting to our project. That's why we also believe in aligners. You can move teeth better and easier and, and with braces, orthodontists are more used to braces, but the future is a liner. Why? Because it's better biomechanics? Maybe yes, maybe no, I'm not an orthodontist. The future is a liner, first of all, because we see that experts in aligners can do anything with aligners nowadays, absolutely any kind of ortho treatment, but mainly because through aligners is the only way to make a 3D digital project become reality in a predictable way. It's the only way to, to move from 3D digital to reality. That's why we believe that the future is with the liners. So this is insight number nine, the facially driven ortho world. 
interdisciplinary integration, ortho as part of a bigger plan, restorative dentists understanding the power of ortho, and we as dentists being able to explain to the patient and have the patient understand and accept why ortho is so powerful in most of the restorative cases. Another concept that I want to share with you is the case classification. And as a technician for me, this is super important because as a technician, I understood that I can be the best partner of the dentist to help the dentist understand the case and organize the thoughts and create the treatment plan. This is again the future of modern technicians. If we don't have to spend that much energy learning how to do micro texture because the computer and the milling machine will do that for us, for sure they're already doing that, we can take that time and invest on learning more about comprehensive, holistic, integrated, interdisciplinary dentistry, communicating with the doctor, expanding our expertise on facial integration, creating projects, beautiful projects, and helping the dentist to understand how to make that project reality. So the first thing that we do after we do the smile frame is to understand what type of case that we are dealing with. And there's basically only six type of cases in restorative dentistry. The cases that are ideal, where teeth, gum, and bite don't need to be changed. is the case that we all love. A little bit of prep, some restorations, and we are done. Everything is pretty much in position. Type number two means we need to change the gum and restore. Three, we need to change the bite for any reason and restore. Four, we need to add some implants, change the tissue and restore. Five, we need to move teeth and restore. And six, we need to move the whole arch and restore. Or a combination of them. What is the thinking process here? We love to restore final restorations on easy cases, right? So what we want to do is to make every complex case become an easy case and then finish the case. So if you have a patient that needs ortho, if you do ortho properly, you're gonna move the teeth inside the frame and at this moment, your patient become, became type one. If you do a great job deprogramming the bite, finding the right vertical, registering this vertical, stabilizing this vertical, you just made this complex patient become type one as well. So every single case can become type one. So we want to make complex become simple and then finish. And this is all, only sometimes used as a thinking process and it helps so much to organize the sequence of the treatment. So let's use the same patient as an exercise over here. This patient has everything. She has deciduous teeth on the canine. She needs extractions and implants. She has a canine on the lateral position. She maybe has some problems with the profile. She has uh, problems with the vertical dimension and occlusion. She has a gummy smile on the back. We see over here maybe gingival plasty. So we start the thinking process. First, the most complex possible procedure, orthognatic surgery. Does it make sense, yes or no? Pros and cons, yes or no? Is it feasible, yes or no? She can be improved with orthognatic, maybe yes, but it doesn't make sense for us on this case. So we jump back into five. Five means orthodontics, definitely an orthodontic case. This teeth is sticking out. We need to intrude these teeth that are going down because there's no lowers here. So it's definitely a case to plan the ortho. So we're gonna start planning the ortho. Ortho intrusion, space distribution, bringing the canine back, maybe moving this natural canine from lateral position to canine position, maybe placing an implant here, maybe transforming this canine into a lateral and placing the implant there. We start to brainstorm that possibility. Then we plan the implants after the ortho, and we can know exactly the position of the implants that we want after orthodontics. And what is the beautiful thing here? That if the ideal position of the implants at the end of the treatment are not interfering with the actual position, non-ideal of the teeth right now, we can place the implants before ortho. And we can use these implants as fixed or anchorage to speed up and improve the results of orthodontics. So that's so simple to plan in 3D. You move the teeth, you have the ideal design, and you 
place your implants wherever you can when it's not interfering with the ideal project. And this is what we're gonna do. Implants on the bottom where it's missing, maybe implants on the deciduous, and utilize this as an anchorage for orthodontics. Every orthodontist knows how to do that. We, not, we just need to give them the vision of exactly where we want to be. We move into three, vertical dimension. Should we open her bite? Should we change her bite? Definitely, she has a very deep bite, class two. We want to take advantage of the moment here since we're gonna restore everything and open the bite for our convenience. And and allow us to have more space, more space to restore better the patient, to distribute and create clearance. Then we go to type uh, group two, crown lengthen. Yes, she's also a crown lengthen, maybe just gingival plasty here. And since we are doing ortho, because of the other reasons, we're gonna do mini implants here and aggressively intrude this area instead of aggressively crown lengthening here on the back. So we're gonna do gingival plasty and ortho intrusion combination. And then finally, as the final touch, we're gonna place the final restorations, mainly veneers, couple of implant restorations, preserving and doing minimally invasive restorations to preserve as much as possible enamel for her. So we see here her little video of the first, uh, first step, orthodontics. And again, just showing an example of a conventional orthodontic planning, no clue, no vision, no reference. And we made this test. You can send this to the best orthodontists in the world, best technicians, best software. They will align teeth, usually with intraoral references without having in consideration your final aesthetic project. Now, instead of doing that, we're gonna bring the project in green and with transparency. And in this case, very important because she has a canted arch. So we need to calculate the intrusions and extrusions and soft tissue alignments with ortho and perio to have the ideal scenario to do the final restorations after. So this is exactly what we are planning here with the 3D integration between smile design, facially driven smile design and orthodontic movements. So this is insight number 10. Case classification, the six groups Try to imagine what is needed to bring the patient from complex to simple and then achieving the ideal final outcome. Quickly, bite registration. I don't wanna get deep into it, but we know that this is one of the key factors for the dentist to take advantage of the digital world. This is something that the CAD CAM expert cannot help the dentist. The dentist has to still be an expert or have somebody on his team that understands how to deprogram a bite, evaluate the TMJ, evaluate the muscles, and find this comfortable, safe, and healthy position, position the jaw there, and register the jaw. How, with what technique, with what philosophy, it doesn't matter for us. What I usually ask the doctor is I look at this and I say, doctor, is this a safe position? Can I trust this position? That's all I ask. I don't even call CR, because I don't know if it's CR. I don't know if the doctor believes on CR. It doesn't really matter. What we need is a comfortable and safe position that we can rehabilitate this patient. Now, if we do have, or if we do have this position, we can do some beautiful things for the dentist. We can close this gap with a device like this, and then, or close the gap with additional restorations like this. So you see the face project all the way down to the new vertical dimension, and then you can print or mill these restorations, and this is something beautiful. You can do transitional, prepless, full mouth, aesthetic, functional rehabilitations in one shot nowadays. If you have a patient, complex bite, you don't know exactly how to find this position, you just get that registration, bring it to the 3D world, design this, fill in the space, and bond this additional to the teeth, or make a snap-on. We do many times this as a snap-on, that the patient can use this for one month, three months, six months. Every time the patient comes back, the patient feels comfortable, bite is stable, we can trust that, patient is happy, you just transform a super complex full mouth rehabilitation into single unit dentistry. Because now here I can prep only this if I want one day. I can extract maybe this, put an implant and a crown over here. Or I can do the four anteriors at one shot because the patient is complaining he wants the final ceramics. It doesn't matter. Now we have the case solved in one session. 
in one appointment. It's one appointment to document, make the impressions, make the bite, the other one to fit this in the mouth and test drive. If the patient is coming back and it's not comfortable, he doesn't like it, it's painful, you take it out and the patient is back to exactly what he was before. Or you can start equilibrating the case and trying to move that position until you find that comfortable position. I saw many times dentists jumping into treatments like this, prepping some teeth, losing the old bite, not finding the new, and then we were in trouble, deep trouble with the patient. Now when we find that situation, we have this kind of snap-on or transitional bonded restoration. Old days was a wax up that we needed to transform into final. Nowadays is a digital design completely facially driven, integrated with the whole treatment that is exported into a restorative software that can fabricate restorations with the exact same shape, position, vertical dimension, and occlusion of the test drive. That is the beauty of copying what is already tested. So we have one case like this, opening the vertical, deprogramming, look at the software, fine tune the vertical, design your additional restorations, create the strategy if it's gonna be a bonded additional or it's gonna be a removable snap-on, depending on the case, depending on the volumes, depending on the clearance. We can also mill these restorations and utilize them as a more long-term prepless uh, situation. We can split them, we can make them fit without having to worry about path of insertion because we try not to touch the teeth, we just want to add to test drive this in the most minimally invasive possible. Whenever the patient is comfortable, you can use these transitional restorations as prep guides. So you prep, we prep through this situation to have the exact clearance that we want. So four steps to plan these cases utilizing this visualization. Step number one, design the upper against the face. Put translucency, see the discrepancy, see if it's possible to fix, see, see if it makes sense. If not, adapt the design to facilitate the treatment. Step number two, find the bite. Are you keeping the old bite? Are we rehabilitating on maximum intercuspation? Is this new design interfering with the old bite? Do we want to change the old bite anyway? Do we want to open the vertical? If we're gonna change the bite, we need to deprogram and find the most comfortable position. This is not a tooth relationship. This is a TMJ muscle, muscle relationship. Then number three, still not a tooth relationship. We are fine tuning the vertical. We fine tune the vertical for our convenience, for our convenience. So we're gonna fine tune the vertical for two reasons. Restorative space on the back, and functional integration on the front. So this is the moment we are fine tuning because we know that vertical dimension is a window that the patient can be comfortable. We're gonna take advantage of that and fine tune that position according to our convenience. And finally, only after that, we're gonna design the lowers against the uppers. One, two, three, four. Every single case, we think the same way. So, insight number 11, Four steps of functional aesthetics integration. If we start to think like that in every single case, even on the simple cases, we practice that, it becomes natural, we become a better treatment planner again. We have more five minutes. Restoratively speaking, it was 7.15, right? So I'm right on time, right? Okay, so I'm gonna be five minutes late. Five Brazilian minutes, fine? It's different than England, huh? If we have a case, ideal design is behind the actual situation. What do we do for the dentist? We save this project, we adapt this project, we build everything out, why? So the patient, so the doctor can place a motivational mock-up in the mouth. Then we go back to the ideal and we're gonna trim what is sticking out and we're gonna create the ideal project. So what we have now, we have three projects in front of us, ideal with the teeth sticking, non-ideal adapted outside to put in the patient's mouth, preoperatively, motivational mock-up, and number three, ideal back to ideal with no teeth sticking out. So we trim digitally. What do we do? Motivation first. The teeth are slightly too big. It doesn't matter. Patients will love it. You're gonna film this, you're gonna show them. You saw him saying, this is a real patient again. Wow, that's what we want to hear. 
Wow, when they say wow, we say, okay, he's ready to listen to our treatment plan. So the patient accepted, he was super cool, I love it, I wanna do it, so what do we do? We go back, we remove the motivational mockup that is not the ideal project, we put the first project that has windows, reduction guides, and we're gonna prep only the windows until the third guy goes in. When the third guy goes in, means the ideal project can fit. When the ideal project can fit, we do a second mockup. This is not motivational because the case is sold, this is technical mockup. So what we do here, why we do a technical mock-up? Because we always, always, always utilize the technique from Galip Gurel. We don't prep teeth. We prep final designs. We prep mock-up. We want to have exactly the clearance with minimally invasive preps. So we utilize depth cutters over the ideal project to touch the enamel as minimum as possible. Always like that. What happens when we have crown lengthen? What do we do? We do two projects for the doctor. One goes over the gum. Why? motivational mock-up. It's not realistic because the teeth are sticking out cervically to create the simulation of crown lengthen. We save that project, we cut the gum digitally, you can see, now we tilt all the teeth backwards and now we have the realistic situation post-surgery and we save that project as well. We're gonna print two models, we're gonna do two trays, why? First one goes in the mouth, for motivation, second one will guide the preps and the provisionals. We plan the implants on this case, deciduous teeth on the canines, guides, everything is milled and print, everything at once goes to the doctor. Motivation comes first. She didn't know the treatment yet. I think she was ready, right? She loved it, this is motivational. You will see that when we look close by, they're not even great, it doesn't matter. It's a social distance mock-up, we show them, that's why we never give the mirror. We film them, we present that to them, they love it, so we can immediately jump into the treatment. We create guides for guided crown lengthening, double guides, soft tissue and bone. So you have the soft tissue level and three millimeters above, you have the bone level if you need to open the flap or probe the bone to evaluate biological width. So here the surgeon is doing, this is Miguel Stanley operating here. So you see 2D, 3D guides, crown lengthening is done. And then we were able to move forward, extractions, completely guided surgery, minimally invasive preps, immediate prov provisionalization, utilizing the second model. So we see the difference here. And I promise this is to finish. Four workflows with implants. You have single implants, implant bridges, and full arches with the teeth, with patients with teeth and extraction, or patients that already come without teeth. So what do we do? 2D the same way, same way. 2D becomes 3D exactly the same way as well. So we have the ideal final outcome for them. Then what we do on the single implant, we always go, try to go for completely guided. Why? Because we can design the final abutment and do everything in one shot. So the guys will have the metal cylinders. We're going to place the implant through the guide and place the final abutment in the same appointment. If we have a bridge, we don't do final abutments because the technology is not there yet to create passive fit on the digital workflow combining two, three, or four implants. So what we usually do, we design, we create the uh, provisional abutments, and we create a tray, a tray for the pickup. So this provisional is the one that is identical to the project with the same vertical dimension, same aesthetic, same position, but it's not loose. It fits to a tray that fits into the mouth that allows us to go and pick up in the mouth. So here's the definitive abutment, provisional, provisional abutments, picking up, and screw retain provisional. When it's a full extraction case, still with remaining teeth to be extracted, the very important is that we're gonna take this project, plan the implants, create this file, and this is gonna be the core of the case. Once we, the first thing, we're gonna create a guide that fits over the remaining teeth, that is a drilling guide, only to position the three pins, always three pins. This is the core of the concept. If the patient doesn't have teeth, we don't have teeth to fit this, so we need to make a guide that fits to the lower so the patient will bite. And when they bite, we're gonna drill the three pins that you see here exactly as you see there. If needed, we're gonna plan and design the reduction bone guides, and these will fit exactly to the same three pins, so we cut the bone at the perfect position according to the project. Then comes the third guide. The third guide fits to the same 
same position and you place the implants. Not necessarily fully guided, just the first drilling as a reference and do the implants as you wish. We need an approximate position. Why? Because we're gonna pick up the implants with the final dentures. The final dentures will have the same exact three pins. You're gonna put this in, you're gonna pick up the implants, and you're gonna have in one shot, same vertical, same occlusion, same aesthetics, same facial integration, without wasting hours to adjust them. And this is the final insight. 12, complete digital workflow. So I know it was short, I know I was trying to be fast, but I hope I was able to share with you the vision of this new way of doing dentistry, enhanced by technology with, with the same old principles. And I want to thank my family, my ancestors, all dentists, so we have it in our blood. And I want to finish with one question. Are you ready? Because technology is ready. Are we ready for the drinks? Yes. Thank you. Thank you.